everybody and good morning for joining us. My name is Maha Yahya. I'm the director of the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Center in Beirut. I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, chairing and moderating this panel today's launch of a newly released uh, Routledge handbook on EU and Middle East relations. I'm going to take a moment to just show you the book. Um, this book is edited by Dimitris Bouris, Daniela Hubert, and Michel Pace, uh, the Amsterdam Center for European Studies in cooperation with the EU East Network in Action, Rock Slide University, and the Instituto Afari International, <laughs> uh, IAI. Um, so they are already hosting a series of online panels that the central themes in this book, the book is about, I think, I believe around 41 years, and it's looking at both the history, but also the trends of EU, uh, Middle East and North Africa relations on very different uh, topics and very, at the very different levels. I highly recommend that you take a look at the book uh, and consider uh, getting it. So today, uh, I'm delighted to say we're going to have a very rich discussion with a, uh, some stellar uh, participants, uh, all of whom are authors uh, in this book. I'll begin with my colleague, uh, Cornelius Abhar, who, uh, Adabhar, who's at uh, an resident fellow at Carnegie, um, Frederica Bici, who's the director of the European Policy, Foreign Policy Unit at LSE, the London School of Economics and Political Science. Asim Dandeshli, who is a tenured assistant professor uh, of political science at the university. Maria, Maria Luisa Frantepi, Tapi, uh, who's a special advisor for the Middle East and North Africa region at the Center for Human Dialogue. And Benedetta Voltolini who's a lecturer in European foreign policy at the Department of European International Studies at King's College. Um, today, we will be focusing on one section of the book, which is entitled Peace, Security and Conflict in the Middle East. And I'll be dividing the discussion into three distinct sections. Uh, first, we're going to begin with uh, the, with Frederica uh, on uh, to talk about a little bit about the uh, 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 and Benedetta, sorry, Fredica and Benedetta, to talk about the uh, EU's role in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, let me just begin by saying that today a, an Al Jazeera uh, journalist was shot dead by Israeli sniper fire in, uh, in uh, Palestinian territories. And um, it's still not clear. It's very clear that over the last month or so, the situation has been flaring up uh, in the territories and in Jerusalem. So, but before we get into the present day, I really would like to begin by asking you both to perhaps talk a little bit about the history of uh, what you call actually an extraordinary uh, journey of uh, how the on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has developed especially as it went from one that was quite cohesive and actually uh, ahead of its times in some, in some ways. Uh, they took up positions way before others did, for example, on what is a, on border issues, amongst other things, and where it is now what you describe as a very fragmented approach, uh, particularly after 2016. So I don't know who of you would like to begin, perhaps first few comments on the history of those relations and how it worked. Frederica? So I guess I will start. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the, for the invitation <laughs> and for giving us the opportunity to speak about uh, our chapter and our work on, on EU policy um, towards the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. So uh, following your suggestion, so I will uh, be presenting briefly the um, evolution of the European Union position while Federica will speak more about uh, the last few years and the increasing uh, fragmentation that we see again. So basically in the chapter, we uh, analyze this, this evolution of the uh, European position towards the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, which can, 
we can describe as a, as a development of, of a common approach um, because in the very beginning, member states were not united. So there was strong disunity. Progressively, member states managed to create a more coherent position towards the conflict. Uh, and we see that from the late 1960s to around 2015, but then has then been followed again by fragmentation, especially since 2016. Um, when, when I speak about the European position, I mean uh, the uh, position of the European Community, European Union and its member states. And uh, uh, we can say that this position uh, has, uh, or yes, was, was developed in two main stages or two main steps. One is uh, um, the uh, definition of a discursive practice uh, centered around the Green Line. And the second uh, stage is the enactment of this uh, discourse in practice, starting first with economic arrangements and then uh, moving to also uh, legal and administrative measures. So the, um, in a nutshell, we can say that the core element of uh, the European position revolves around the uh, construction and the implementation of the Green Line, so the 1949 Armistice Line, as the border between Israel and Palestine as far as EU policy is concerned. And this, is, this, this position comes also in the absence of an internationally or locally recognized uh, border between Israel and Palestine. And we can see uh, first the first references to the Green Line as the border between Israel and Palestine for the European Union um, already in the early 70s, for example, in the Schumann paper of 1971, in which the six uh, member states converged on uh, the position of France concerning uh, the border uh, and called for the Israeli withdrawal from all the occupied territories, from all the territories that Israel occupied in 1967. And this position was also reiterated in uh, several other declarations, and we can see that, for example, in the November 1973 declaration after the Yom Kippur War. And uh, this consensus of, on, on the Green Line as the border between Israel and Palestine, we can say that it crystallized in the 1980 Venice Declaration, which is, of course, the most famous uh, one. And uh, um, uh, that is kind of seen also as the founding moment of the current EU approach, and at the time was also a pioneering uh, position um, that, um, uh, that was a kind of a forerunner compared to other international uh, actors. And then this position, we can say, has been reiterated several uh, times again uh, over the decades. These, uh, uh, this discourse that basically the green light is the border between Israel and Palestine when it comes to the bilateral dealing uh, with the European Union and its member states took a bit longer uh, to be implemented, to be put uh, in, uh, in practice. And the first era where we see this, this implementation is uh, when it comes to trade agreements, because this is where the European Union has exclusive uh, competence. And uh, we can see this clear uh, distinction and the organization of um, two uh, parallel and legally separate economic frameworks under uh, European community law in the uh, Council regulation of 1986, which basically allowed goods um, originating from the occupied Palestinian territories to um, enter the European market um, under a preferential treatment uh, which was distinct from the agreement with, uh, with Israel. Um, this, uh, uh, this position um, and this distinction uh, between uh, the occupied territories and Israel as two separate economic um, uh, territories um, went a bit into trouble with the um, EU-Israel Association Agreement, which didn't clearly specify the green line as, uh, as the border, and therefore Israel applied it also to the Israeli settlements in the territories. Um, but to cut a long story short, uh, in 2009, the um, Court of Justice of the European Union clarified that Israel and the West Bank 
constitute two separate and not overlapping economic entities. Two different agreements apply to them, and therefore goods from Israeli settlements cannot benefit from preferential access under the EU-Israel Association uh, Agreement. And this position was further reiterated in the Council conclusion in 2012, that basically stated that um, all agreements between the European Union and Israel are not applicable to the occupied uh, territories, including the Golan Heights and Eastern Europe. Um, and from that, uh, basically, we can see a number of agreements that contain this uh, distinction between Israel and its uh, settlements and the occupied territories. And these agreements all clarify that uh, the uh, occupied territories and the Israeli settlements uh, are not um, under the scope of the, uh, of the agreements. And just to give you, to mention two uh, quite famous example, one is the guidelines of uh, 2013, when mm -hmm. um, the territories, it was clearly stated that all territories that came on after, um, under the administration of Israel after uh, 1967 are not eligible to receiving funding from the European uh, Union. And the other is the labeling case in which basically um, goods needs to be properly labeled uh, in order not to mislead uh, European uh, consumers. So Israeli settlements need to be, uh, Israeli settlements goods needs to be labeled as Israeli settlement. So basically, as you can see, uh, there was a discursive position that the US developed over the years. Uh, this position has been implemented into practice, but then these, uh, this momentum uh, has come to a sort of a halt in, uh, 2015, 2016, when member states' position began to differ again. And so there was again a fragmentation. And uh, uh, we can see that um, uh, in relation to council conclusion and the role that there was around the council conclusion of 2016, January 2016, when Greece basically reopened an already agreed uh, text and watered down the wording of that text. Uh, but also uh, we can see the fact that um, agency moved away from the European Union towards member states that either acted unilaterally, like France in 2016, or, um, or in group of, uh, groups of like-minded uh, states. And here I leave the floor to Federica, who can uh, better uh, explain these dynamics and what is going on at the moment. So basically we're moving from a more coherent and cohesive position to a much more fragmented one. Frederica, can you take us through this fragmentation and what that means for the, you know, dealing with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict today? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. I'll make just the three quick points uh, and then uh, I hope we can come back to this uh, uh, with your comments, Maha, and uh, uh, in the Q&A. The first point I want to make is that we're actually moving from fragmentation to a sort of silence uh, on this topic. Um, the second point I want to make is that in this silence, some issues grow out of proportion or don't grow at all. Uh, and the third point is, however, uh, I want to finish on a more optimist mode uh, to say that this is quite an interesting uh, moment and I'll explain uh, why I'll be very, very brief, I promise. Um, so my first point is that we're moving from fragmentation to silence. Um, in 2019, when we basically finished this chapter, the situation was of two loosely defined blocks of member states uh, with very different uh, opinions and some neutral countries uh, in the middle, so to say. Uh, however, now uh, there is uh, more of a sort of a uh, detachment uh, from this uh, dossier. There isn't a Middle East peace process uh, and there isn't uh, really a discussion among member states about how to uh, bring this uh, forward. The last time that the EU issued a proper declaration on the Middle East peace process was in June 2016. 
Since then, they have mentioned the Middle East peace process, they have touched upon the Middle East peace process, they have certainly discussed it uh, in a number of occasions, but they've left uh, the uh, floor to uh, local statements by the uh, EU delegation or by heads of missions, um, ambassadors, or uh, by the uh, high representative. This is not just on the Middle East peace process, it's a more general tendency of EU foreign policy, but it also shows the difficulties that member states are finding when it comes to develop common positions on complex foreign affairs matters. Um, so in a way, if you want to, with a big simplification, but uh, to just to create focal points, we can say that, you know, there was a lot of discussion at one point about the southern neighborhood as a ring of friends. Um, then uh, the discussion moved to uh, characterize this wrongly in a way, but uh, as a ring of uh, fire. Uh, and that, now it looks like uh, things are moving towards a, a ring <laughs> of uh, disinterest, uh, of uh, detachment. Uh, of expanding uh, the conceptual uh, and uh, political distance uh, between the EU and the southern uh, uh, neighborhood. So, uh, Frederica, point... can I can I just interrupt you here for a second and just ask: Can the EU afford to do that? Especially as we're seeing the situation, particularly over the last last, last month, flare up again. Um, I mean, people are talking about a potential third intifada. I mean, this it, it's very. Can the EU afford to kind of move towards this? Uh, uh, Maha, obviously, of this interest. <laughs> obviously not. Uh, but I like your rings. <laughs> that they uh, that they are not going to do it because the problem that we see uh, is that in a way. Um, there is a new appetite in the Middle East for diplomacy, uh, you know, for trying to go beyond conflicts and thinking of different solutions. Uh, but the EU is not part of it. Uh, and member states are moving in a uh, separate manner. Um, they're trying to create uh, their own networks and not necessarily uh, coordinate at the EU level. Uh, this makes uh, for a bit of a um, big missed opportunity uh, if the EU finds uh, unity on the eastern neighborhood, as they're finding big time, well, nice to see, uh, but not on the southern neighborhood. Um, part of the issue uh, is also linked to the fact that the EU is paradoxically becoming quite good at using uh, uh, military security defense uh, discussions, uh, but uh, it, less uh, so when it comes to sophisticated political and diplomatic uh, discussions, especially when they require mid to long term require um, uh, engagement. Um, and instead, my second point, you know, some issues that grow out of proportion is, for instance, the discussion about the Palestinian textbooks, uh, which is heavily promoted by Commissioner Vahaley uh, as, a, as a way to condition aid uh, to the Palestinians in a way that is uh, unheard of uh, in other uh, contexts. Or, you know, uh, some issues like uh, uh, violence on the ground uh, is not receiving sufficient uh, attention and not receiving, you know, the type of political engagement uh, that would contribute to address uh, uh, issues and come to a positive, uh, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say conclusion, but at least to a positive uh, uh, compromise. Uh, however, I'll stick to my uh, uh, um, optimistic uh, assumptions, meaning that what we're witnessing is a, a sort of a, a multipolar Mediterranean. There are many uh, issues that are happening and moving and potentially leading to uh, shifts uh, in political position. And so this uh, could uh, help the uh, EU um, uh, uh, you know, you have a, a more interesting engagement uh, with the region if it manages to keep a united voice and a single voice. But I'll stop there because uh, I know that there are more interesting points to come from other panelists. 
Thank you for the Let me ask just one last question on this topic before we move to uh, an equally, uh, well, I don't know equally, but as convoluted uh, situation in Iraq and Lebanon. Um, just a question to both of you. Do you believe that the UN still thinks that the two, I mean, is the aim still, if there is interest, to push for a two-state solution? Or is it the fact that the situation has changed so much on the ground that the difficulties of achieving the two-state solution has become far, what, far higher at this point? Uh, anybody speak here? Because uh, uh, they, uh, the, the two-state solution has become a bit of a holy grail, uh, uh, but it is the only one uh, that um, on which member states can find uh, uh, some common, common ground. ground. Yeah. Uh, so moving beyond that is potentially more rewarding in terms of uh, uh, practicalities and uh, would open up a discussion, but um, we're not there yet. And we, uh, in order to discuss uh, to ser seriously discuss alternatives, uh, we would need the, uh, the more uh, space in terms of uh, uh, member states having the intention, the desire, the energy to put their minds together and come up with something different, something that instead they're uh, totally focused on Ukraine and they will remain so for quite a while. I was going to say with the Ukraine conflict, it's probably impossible for to get anyone to focus on anything other than Ukraine at this point at the moment, for, yeah. for many reasons. Uh, Benedetta, I don't know if you want to add anything to what was said, maybe in response to any of the questions. Uh, I totally agree <laughs> with Federica. <laughs> Okay, let me thank you both. I will we'll be coming back to more, more, more discussions on this issue, but I want to now move to Asim and Maria Luisa uh, to talk about two countries uh, and the relationships of the EU with two countries that have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. Uh, both Lebanon and Iraq are governed through a multi-sectarian uh, power sharing arrangement. Actually, the one in Iraq was to some extent modeled on the Lebanese one. Uh, the kind of this power sharing between different sectarian and ethnic groups, which for Iraq was a novelty when the, you know, uh, the, when it was put together in the post-2003 uh, invasion, the US invasion of Iraq and the dismantling of state institutions there. So um, let me begin with you, uh, Maria Luisa, to talk a little bit about um, the evolution of the European act, uh, relationship with Iraq uh, post-2003 and where it is today. And then I'll probably come back later to a question in terms of uh, how it views its relationship with, uh, you know, both countries also, both Lebanon and Iraq have gone through these uprisings in 2019, popular uprisings, there's a lot of civic movements. So there's a bit of a shared uh, trajectory there, if you like, to some extent despite the different, radically different sizes in the countries. So Maria Luisa, let me begin with you. If you could talk, talk us through a little bit uh, the EU-Iraq relations. Sure. Uh, thank you, Maha. Thank you for this uh, invitation. It's a pleasure really to discuss this very um, uh, challenging topics at this, uh, at this specific moment where EU foreign policy is uh, evolving and we don't know yet in which direction though. <laughs> Um, but um, in relation to uh, EU-Iraq relations, I would say that uh, um, the, if we look really at the post-2003 um, uh, engagement of the EU in Iraq, which is the focus of my uh, chapter, I think uh, that it's quite fair to say that uh, uh, the experience of the EU in Iraq in this last 20 years shows uh, really uh, the limits of EU foreign policy it, in all its different components. Uh, first, it shows the um, inability of um, uh, overcoming and I mean, uh, finding really and carving out the strategic autonomy. So um, uh, the, um, in some way, the divisions also 
also that uh, came uh, and emerged in 2003 about the 2003 war between EU member states, between a, a front uh, of EU member states who were actually supportive of the war and the front of other member states like France in particular and Germany who was actually opposing, um, opposing the, the US-led invasion, already uh, showed the limits of EU foreign policy. It was 2003, uh, a moment where in the previous 10 years, the EU foreign policy had had a lot of uh, momentum. And really in 2003, you have a stop of this momentum. Uh, so Iraq really, it's, it's, it's a stumbling block in some way that in, in this trajectory of EU foreign policy. And, and I think that over there in 2003, it emerges really in these divisions between countries who oppose the war and member states who actually support the war, the real core difference between what we call the Atlantis, the group of the Atlantis, so EU member states who actually prioritize the Atlantic NATO alliance and other member states to actually think, no, you should have its own foreign and security policy. So it's also should build its own defense, um, defense policy, and it should actually uh, step by step carve out for itself a strategic autonomy from the United States. And I think that this uh, this debate between the group of the um, uh, member states who were supportive of uh, of uh, of uh, who were prioritizing uh, the Atlantic Alliance and others who were instead uh, investing into a new uh, defense and security policy, it remained as a threat, uh, as an an, an overcome problem all over the, the 20 years, and it sort of froze, if let me say, the the, the possibility really for the the EU uh, to work as a coherent um, policy uh, entity. And so you have um, also this uh, um, problem that has been also discussed in the pre by the previous uh, speakers of the um, uh, limits in really shaping uh, an EU coherent policy and the dominance of EU member states over a overall EU um, coherent uh, policy making. So what happened what happens is, uh, um, I think that really um, the case of Iraq really shows that uh, uh, EU member states were uh, only uh, willing to work together on very uh, soft power issues. Uh, so you have moments where, for example, there was uh, um, a sort of uh, better level of agreement among EU member states, for example, when the, there was the rise of Daesh and the Islamic State, of course, this was a threat for all member states. But even in that moment, what is very interesting to see is that uh, despite the unity in terms of like on paper, but still the EU member state single unilateral um, decision making, it prevails over really the fact that uh, the EU member state work within a coherent, in a coherent framework. And I would also say, and this you can see it as well in the fact that uh, um, uh, this actually security uh, issues, they actually um, heightened it and highlighted even more how each one of the EU member states was uh, engaging with Baghdad and Erbil over delivery of weapons in a new unilateral way. So there was really the framework of the coalition, but it was not the framework of the EU. So the, the things that they were, co that the EU member states they were cooperating on, they were soft issue. And I think that um, uh, another limit that, uh, that is shown by the EU uh, foreign policy in Iraq is that when EU member states cooperate over soft power issues, it's good. So there is an EU Iraq strategy, but it's not enough. It's not enough because it means that the EU has can work, for example, on technical contribution. For example, the CSDP missions for uh, security sector reform um, or uh, human support for human rights, other technical or support for the judiciary, but still the technical interventions without a united political will, it has shown really to deliver very few results. Also because, you know, Maha yourself, when you have a counterpart, which is a um, fragmented political framework like that one of Iraq, where you have shattered the institution, it's very difficult actually to deliver good technical results. 
Then you have um, the um, trajectory of working on principled position. And so when there was the appraising in 2019, of course, the EU member states were united in um, voicing support for the civic activists. But once again, the principled support without actually political actions, once again, almost has a backlash on the EU image, because it means you, you, you are preaching about human rights, but what are you actually doing for protecting civic activists? from harassments, from killings. And I will say that the third and the last point is that um, even when there was for the EU in Iraq an um, opportunity to be a mediator at the heightened moment of tension between the US and, the Iran, and, and Iran tension in Iraq, which was like the, during especially the Trump administration when this tension really reached a high peak, the EU, precisely because it had failed in some way to build this coherent approach and also to uh, sort of uh, work together in a more political manner, it actually couldn't in some way take that role of a mediator. So even in, when there was an opportunity for the EU, that opportunity was not, was not seized. Now, it is interesting to see how um, this limits, um, these limitations, so limitations in, 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 uh, in related to the strategic autonomy, um, limitations related to the EU coherent polit political will, how these are going to evolve after the Ukraine war, war. I do think, and I do share the assessment of my of the previous speaker saying that I think that while we are seeing on the Eastern front of Europe, a lot of uh, political will and uni unity when the southern front of the alliances of the EU is actually going to be more neglected and therefore this fragmentation and these problems that we just outlined and probably they're just going to grow even deeper and I'm going to stop here thank you Thank you, Maria Luisa. We'll come back to this uh, in a second when I, uh, after, after I give Asim a chance to speak a little bit about Lebanon, because I think also the EU's relationship to both Lebanon and Iraq in very different ways, obviously, uh, it tells us a little bit about how things may evolve. Uh, I mean, my concern is that neglecting the southern neighborhood, so to speak, um, is only going to bring further instability, which is going to pull uh, both the EU and the West back in again at some point down the road. Um, unfortunately, that's the way things are. But Asim, let me just uh, move to you and ask you to speak a bit to, uh, to the evolution of uh, Lebanon's diplomatic relations with the EU. I mean, we saw that it began with 19, the 1965 Trade and Cooperation Agreement that was signed with France and then became an association agreement with the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership. So can you, can you talk a little bit, a few words about this trajectory and maybe bring it up to where it is uh, today, including what are the key priorities that you're seeing in this relationship? Yeah, thank you, Maha. Thank you everyone for organizing this. I think you already started on the, uh, on the topic. And, uh, as you said, like the relations with Lebanon started already in the uh, since the creation of Lebanon in the forties, or the uh, the independence of Lebanon in the forties, and like uh, the trade and technical cooperation agreement in nineteen sixty five, and then the association agreement that entered into force in uh, two thousand six, followed by the action plan that was adopted in two thousand seven, and. The the while the agreement uh, has been comprehensive and covered areas from uh, democratic uh, democracy promotion to economic development to security etc. We see that even we we cannot treat all these uh, elements or all these uh, issues equally in the relations with the EU. The EU is still considered the main uh, trading partner, tra uh, the main economic partner to the uh, to Lebanon uh, uh, since uh, since the uh, end of the uh, civil war in the uh, end of the 80s, early 90s. The EU has been the most important international player and donor to uh, Lebanon, along with the uh, Gulf countries. And we've seen that over the years when Lebanon had suffered economically due to many different reasons and mainly the corruption and the clientelistic and favoritism and sectarianism in the, uh, uh, in the country, we see that the, the European Union, mainly France, 
rush to help the country with the Paris 1 agreement, Paris 2 agreement, Paris 3 agreement, with the hope that the Lebanese will take some uh, reforms, uh, fighting corruption, etc., which never happened. And then they learned the lesson with the Seder agreement that you will not get a penny if you don't do any reforms. And Till, by, till I think the moment we are talking now, nothing has happened uh, sig uh, in terms of reforming the system. And we're talking now about a failed state, despite that the elections are coming. So the, the, the first uh, point uh, is the economic cooperation and the EU aid has been really strong. The EU is the main trade partner to, the, uh, to Lebanon. Uh, and the, uh, despite that the EU basically the ex uh, export to Lebanon more than uh, Lebanon can ex uh, export back to the uh, to the EU, but still, like also in terms of EU aid, the EU is the number one donor to uh, Lebanon. Uh, the second area that uh, is important in the relations is the issue of uh, uh, democracy and uh, reforms of the. Uh, political system in the in the country despite all the support that the eu tried to put into institution building human rights uh, civil liberties uh, individual rights uh, reforming the judiciary etc following the taif agreement uh, and the uh, end of the civil war we don't see much moving on in the country and i'm not blaming the eu for that but it's mostly that this the way the system is uh, build up, like we talk about 100 years of Aish uh, Mushtarak, if you want to call it uh, what the Lebanese so existence. Call it. And, uh, and this so never existence. worked. It, it never really worked. Like you're talking about a sectarian system, that e clientelistic system, we ca you can call it also a tribal system, like based on sects, and each uh, sect is trying to get as much as they want from the cake, and this never worked in, uh, in Lebanon over the past hundred years. So why should it work in Iraq uh, uh, now? So the uh, democracy promotion, as in many other countries, has been problematic. Uh, one way, one one reason for that is Lebanon, the Lebanese political system, the Lebanese politicians, the Lebanese elites, and the people themselves. Uh, corruption is at different levels. Uh, and uh, the sectarian system, but at the same time, this has never been a real priority for the EU, and we see this not only in Lebanon, but the entire uh, MENA region. The third uh, focal point, and I think this is the most important uh, cooperation, is the security cooperation, and uh, the only institution in Lebanon that everyone seems to agree on domestically, internationally, is the security, the army, and the collaboration between the European Union and mainly like uh, France and other uh, European countries with the Lebanese army and the different Lebanese security forces is very strong. And this has evolved over the years and has progressed over the years, despite all the uh, problems that the country is facing uh, at the moment. Uh, Lebanon still, uh, the Lebanese army and uh, Lebanese security forces is still uh, receive a lot of uh, aid from the European Union, European member states, and also share a lot of security and intelligence between uh, both parties. Uh, three, four, the fourth point is uh, the conflict with Israel and the issue of the Palestinian refugees. And here, like, in terms of the conflict with Israel, the EU doesn't have much compared to the uh, United States which is still involved also in the marking of the borders with uh, Israel, the talks that are on hold now, it is the US that is uh, basically uh, trying to mediate between both parties. You're talking about the maritime borders. Yes, the maritime border. The maritime but even borders, with that, the US yes. is the main player. However, after the, the in terms of the uh, support to the refugee camps, in Lebanon, uh, we see that the EU is the main uh, provider for the uh, United uh, uh, for the UNRWA, United, uh, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. So the EU is the number uh, one donor uh, to this uh, agency that provides a lot of uh, uh, support to the refugees, Palestinian refugees in the country. And also the EU is, or EU member states are the number one contributors to the UNIFIL. And uh, after the 2006, the, uh, the, uh, the EU increased its support to UNIFIL uh, to, to, to make sure that there is sort of stability 
uh, in terms of the on the borders between the uh, Lebanese and the uh, and the uh, Israelis, and also we still have the uh, Shaba. Farm there's and, a yes. Sorry, one second. You're talking about the uh, UNIFIL, and there's a question from the audience saying, mm -hmm. "Is the are the European tro uh, troops seeing as part of the EU Lebanese relations?" or EU-UN relations. I believe it's more UN relations because yes, UNIFIL are under the, the auspices. Uh, yeah, this is within the United Nations, but also the, the good relations that Lebanon has with many of the uh, EU countries who are contributing to the uh, to UNIFIL has, sir, has helped in the renewal for UNIFIL every year, because every year it's, uh, there's, a, there's some discussions about it in the uh, media and in the political discourse, will there be a veto or will we shall we increase the uh, tasks of the UNIFIL or keep it as it is? And I think so far the, the strong relations that the Liban Lebanon has with some of the uh, in many with many of the EU countries has helped in uh, maintaining this uh, involvement in the UNIFIL and not ex not really changing its mandate beyond uh, that might create some domestic uh, problems in the country. Uh, uh, the last point with, res with respect to the relation is the Syrian refugee crisis, and I think with the Syrian refugee crisis, the EU has supported a lot, but it's not really enough in a country that is failing, uh, in a failed state at all different levels. Uh, what the EU has been offering in terms of support to the, uh, uh, to the refugees, uh, Syrian refugees, the different Brussels conference that took place in 2017-18, 19 to deal with the refugee crisis and provide them with support is not really sufficient, especially that the infrastructure in Lebanon and the uh, space and the size of the country doesn't really allow for having over 1 million Syrian refugee in, in the country, especially that the country is has a lot of it has very limited resources. And I think uh, the solution for that is that they, since the situation in Syria is getting stable, that they have to return back to their country and we cannot post awesome. them forever. I'm going to interrupt you just here because I need to go back to uh, Maria, but I want to just make a couple of comments, uh, forgive me as both moderator and chair, on the issue of Syrian refugees, um, because there's another question from the audience on Syria and there's no one on the panel to speak to Syria. So I'll just say a few words. I, I think on the issue of Syria, uh, perhaps that's one area where there has been a cohesive position by most EU countries, um, which is to kind of uh, say, unless there's a serious uh, political settlement of some sort, one which takes refugees into account, then uh, we are not going to move towards normalization. Uh, with a regime that is accused of war crimes uh, against its own population. Two, the return of refugees to Syria is uh, Syrian refugees from Lebanon, from Turkey, from Jordan, uh, and other places to Syria is at this point mission impossible. Uh, not because refugees don't want to come back, go back, but because the situation in Syria will not allow them to go back, including the fact that uh, the, uh, the Syrian regime does not want them to go back. There are multiple obstacles at every single level, including uh, forced uh, being, being forced into the army, into military service, including law number 10, which has expropriated their properties. I mean, this is not the space to go into it. But I need to say this at this point because there's no other panelist speaking uh, about Syria within this uh, within this discussion. So it's unfair to just talk about them having to go back. It is a burden on Lebanon, and I think this is where the EU perhaps can work with the Lebanese on this issue, but also with the Jordanians, uh, amongst others. Um, it's uh, involuntary return is not something that uh, the EU in any shape or form can 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 push forward, nor morally should they uh, push forward. And again, going back to the Ukraine crisis, so the issue of refugees has been a, a very marked point. Uh, a sore point for audiences or for for observers from this part of the of the Mediterranean. Um, it, it, Maria, let me let me go back to you and talk uh, to you because you mentioned in your chapter that EU involvement in Iraq uh, could possibly pave the way for a better uh, uh, better situation. Um, it could facilitate a more concrete political action by the EU can possibly save Iraq from becoming a battleground of regional competition. 
I mean, to some extent, it is already a battleground for regional competition between the Iranians, the Americans, and others. But um, you, you, in, in, in your chapter, you're saying that it could possibly mitigate some of this. So can you tell I, us a little bit how you imagine this happening and what kind of political action you see perhaps in the next two years? Well, Maha, this is the problem of the lapse between the time we write the chapter and the time <laughs> it's published, then the situation uh, has already changed, especially, um, and it has become worse than we imagined. So, um, the, I mean, at the time when I when I drafted the, the, the chapter, I mean, I was already uh, cautious, cautious, but um, uh, like uh, mildly positive, because really there was, I think, an opportunity, as I said before, for, uh, for the EU to sort of um, fill in the, that role of a mediator between the um, between the US and the Iranians already uh, the EU had done so during the uh, first nuclear deal so in the moment where actually these tensions were at the highest peak and Iraq was the main battleground of those tensions I really thought that this uh, uh, that, that the EU could have played that role and also there was another um, element uh, um, that in which the EU uh, could um, have and still can I think play a role, which is the in facilitating the um, uh, relations between Iraq and its neighborhood. Um, uh, Federica Mogherini at the time when she was a high representative, actually, she supported this line. Uh, um, uh, Borrell has come to, to Iraq uh, in September, last September, uh, after the Baghdad summit uh, that, as we know, uh, gathered many of the leadership of this, uh, of this, uh, of this region um, in, in Baghdad. But I, I must say that in both the first issue, so as a mediator between the US and Iran, and in the second one, which is Iraq and its neighbor, the, the political contribution has been really minimal. Um, so um, there has been on the table an opportunity, but I think that uh, um, uh, what can be maybe outlined is group of member states, so the core group uh, initiatives and how they can actually lead the way. So um, despite it's difficult to, to have all the member states cooperating on this political initiative, and sometimes core group initiatives or more committed states can actually, you know, lead the way. But to be fit, totally honest with you, we have seen even from a new member state more unilateral actions. I mean, um, uh, I would not hide from you that uh, Manuel Macron uh, chair, chairing the Baghdad summit uh, or like co-chairing it uh, is last uh, August. It came as a surprise in many uh, European capitals. You know, um, uh, I mean, uh, in, in many European diplomats, they just woke up and saw that uh, the French president is going to actually do that. Uh, without even coordinating with the rest. So um, definitely the French commitment to the region, it's well appreciated in terms of like boosting relation, but also I do think that there is uh, um, also a need for really at least cooperation at the level of the core group with other member states in order to, 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 to deliver something that is sustainable. Otherwise, what will happen is that uh, we, I say we as European, we actually portray an interest and then we leave uh, we, we actually raise hope and, ask, and uh, hopes in the region that the U.S. committed to the region, and then you know there is actually no uh, substantial follow-up. This is, uh, I think, something that the scenario that we should avoid. So I would say the opportunities for both policy lines are still there, but in order to make that happen, you need more of core group initiatives and more of uh, um, also um, uh, stronger diplomats, stronger EU diplomats. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I, I, I try to base my chapter on semi-structured interviews with former uh, European diplomats because uh, I, I know them, I, I worked with them. Some of them are very good, um, but they cannot actually operate because they don't have the support uh, to, to do that. But many times also um, there is a lot of uh, bureaucratization of the uh, EU diplomatic service that doesn't actually help to have uh, appointments that are more political. So there is really a more uh, a need for a more political EU and also a better um, selections, I think, of the, of the diplomats that are posted in those places and also giving them more political support to actually operate in, the, in those directions to grasp uh, those opportunities. 
Thank you, Maria. We will, I'll give you a chance to say some final words towards the end. Asim, let me come back to you with a quick question. Actually, I, before I, before that, I wanted to come to you and then go to Asim, just to see in what ways do you think, I mean, we saw a very nascent uh, political uprising in, in Iraq. Uh, we saw mass demonstrations. We saw people, uh, demonstrators getting killed. Parliamentary elections, everything is frozen now. Do you see a role for the... Uh, uh, the 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 situation forward in Iraq, Maria. So it's still to me the the question. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Iraq, and then I'll go to Isam. Uh, well, Asim. in terms of like the the, the uprising, I think um, what what has um, honestly like the 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 Tishrin, the Tishrin movement and the civic movement. It's not just uh, a, an event. It's not just a revolution, really, that happened in October of 2019. I mean, I have followed that, uh, and it's it, it it really built up, and it's it's a generational really um, trend that will continue. We hope that it will provide also new blood and fresh blood into the political class. But uh, um, as it happens uh, in Lebanon, um, many times there is a blockage in transferring those new uh, ideas and also new political culture from the base to the political leadership. So um, in that, I think um, the, the we have seen that in the last election, uh, there are some new candidates who are appointed as, have been like elected as, as MPs. But still, I, I think that the role of the civic activists and the civil society at large, it's really, I see it as a sort of pressure point on the political leadership and also on the international actors to actually uh, raise the standard and raise the bar. We don't have to stop over like uh, poor governance. We have to, we, we need more. We need actually um, to be um, uh, attentive to citizens' needs. And I think that is the main message of the Tishirini movement, which I hope will continue and and i do think that the eu in this but more at the level of the single member state they do are now they are doing now quite a lot in terms of like for example supporting activists that do uh, climate actions they are, i mean several several topics that are very important that really uh, place once again the focus on, on citizens need but this is i mean a very long term process but in that the eu still has a very important role and as i said in the chapter I do think that the EU, uh, it's um, a very strong actor when they have very ad hoc like initiatives that actually have specific and clear um, um, and clear objectives. I have been myself into a very broad CSDP mission, which are very broad security sector reform objectives. And we see how limiting is actually that because you cannot actually, um, you have two broad objectives and so, um the, the the sort of final goal remains blurred and uh, also we don't see really the results and instead when you have very um clear objectives smaller okay. missions then you can deliver something better thank you Thanks, Maria. Asim, let me go back to you and just ask you a quick to answer briefly um, before we move to Iran, because we're starting to get a bit squeezed. Um, how you see uh, EU relations vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon, uh, I mean, Lebanon country that is collapsing today, uh, economically, financially, institutionally, at literally every single level. And we have elections coming up um, in two days, three days. So how do you see the relationship of the EU towards Lebanon evolving in the next uh, few weeks and few months? Will this be contingent on the results of the elections or uh, something else? Uh, th uh, thanks. Uh, a few things. Uh, first, the elections will take place and uh, apparently as long as we have uh, Hezbollah and using its weapons and uh, threatening everyone, uh, that even if the opposition will win the majority, they are not going to rule. And as long as the uh, Hezbollah is involved in the different wars of the region, like and that uh, in Yemen, uh, support, uh, in Syria, and as long as Hezbollah is acting regionally and internationally, uh, and as long as we have this, then I don't think anything will change in the country, unfortunately. 
and the EU has a role to do in, in terms in there, uh, and this relates to the issue with Iran, instead of rushing to get any deal uh, for the heck of getting a deal without dealing with all the terrorist organizations such as Faylaq al-Quds, uh, Hezbollah, and all the different militias, this will not help in uh, so how do you see how do you see the the situation moving is my question because we will move to Iran the, in a the, second this, so this, yeah, this, uh, hopefully the, the elections will take place the EU is uh, monitoring the sending observation mission uh, the Arab League will do the same uh, so uh, so in, in terms of that like we're hoping that with the uh, new uh, elections something will come up like uh, even a tiny change uh, the EU cannot do much without the collaboration of the Gulf countries, and we see that the EU, in a way, uh, since the even before the port explosion, has delegated this task to Macron and France. So this is uh, we see that this has been progressing, but very slowly, and there is some support. But we everyone is waiting to see what's happening. And as long as there's no deal with the IMF, then the the rest of the countries, including EU and the uh, Arab countries will not really uh, support uh, uh, Lebanon economically because at the end of the day, to what extent can they can these politicians be trusted, even those who are in power at the moment? And to be honest, and this is my personal opinion, those politicians who made the country in this situation cannot really pull it out. And unfortunately, what France did and what the, the uh, Macron did precisely when he visited Lebanon after the port explosion and what the support, the meeting with all these politicians who are responsible for the country, unintentionally, they were legitimized by the European Union and they were given more uh, legitimacy as these are the people we talk to. And I think this has to change and hopefully this will change with the elections, although I'm a bit... Uh, doubtful that uh, much will change but Thanks. again like the the key is to have an imf agreement and uh, the eu is there france has uh, has promised with the gulf countries that any support has to come through the imf and that there should be like uh, real monitoring and like real reforms and not like the uh, all the uh, uh, thank you awesome. the money and doing nothing Thank you. And uh, I mean, reforms are preconditions for any IMF deal, but also for any support to Lebanon coming from the EU and others. Cornelius, last but not least, let me turn to you and the Iran deal. Uh, we're seeing negotiations happening in Vienna over the nuclear uh, deal. Um, we're hearing that it, the post probability of this deal being signed uh, are decreasing, and yet there's a new push now by the EU to try and get something on the table. Can we go back a little bit and uh, can you tell us how what you describe in your chapter, uh, you and Ricardo describe how a critical relationship became a troubled one um, between the EU and Iran? Cornelius? Yes, thank you very much. Ah, there uh, you are. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you very much. And apologies. Um, it has never happened to me in the two years that we are Zooming now uh, that the program froze and I, I realized I could not unlock um, the mic button. Uh, so I had to restart my computer while you were speaking. But I, I'm glad I made a, an on-time uh, re-entrance into the discussion. Um, thank you to you uh, for, for moderating, for introducing me. Thank you to uh, Daniela, Deborah, and Dimitris for including this chapter into their book. Um, as you mentioned rightly, uh, I also have a co-author, um, Ricardo, but he cannot be here. Um, so I will uh, be the only one speaking, even though I won't take up his time um, allotted, uh, but uh, try to be brief in, in presenting um, our findings. The first thing, and this is maybe um, the, the heading under which I would put um, my, my short presentation, is that I wish that our chapter had been in a different section of the book. Um, obviously, we're talking about peace, security, and conflict in the Middle East um, today, which is where you will find this chapter. Um, but if ever in the near future, um, a, a chapter on Iran could move to the previous part uh, on MENA-EU relations in the contemporary world, that would be great uh, that Iran uh, could not only or would not only be seen through the lens 
of peace uh, and security and conflict. But I guess that's true for, for most countries that uh, are seen through the prism of a, a very Eurocentric, obviously, view on, on the region. Um, there is one thing uh, that is specific about Iran, and uh, let me just mention this. When uh, Maria previously spoke about EU diplomats, um, uh, unlike Israel, the Palestinian territories, Lebanon and Iraq, there is no EU delegation uh, in Tehran, and I think this is uh, this is something known to obviously the, the Iran crowd, but this is something that that uh, is um, yeah, epitomous um, of the difficulty of the EU's approach, um, the uh, critical and, and constructive approach that the EU would like to have, but the troubled one which which it currently has. And that's an expression um, of the the difficulty how these relations developed. Um, the EU put, well, commission delegations at the time in most countries that it had uh, trade relations with uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and uh, there has never been the moment, uh, an opportune moment, um, to do so with Tehran. Uh, first, after the revolution, uh, relations were strained. Uh, there was a bit of an opening in the 1990s. All this is, is dealt with in the book. Uh, but then since 2003, basically, um, so for nearly 20 years, uh, there has been this singular focus on the nuclear file. Um, so what I would say is that um, there is there is probably um, no other country um, which has this uh, elevated status, no other country in the region which has this elevated status of you know, high stakes involvement with the European Union, meeting uh, foreign ministers, the high representative. Um, uh, there is an Iran task force dedicated uh, exclusively to the country in the European External Action Service. And at the same time, um, a, a narrow focus on just one topic. Um, so that is what, what differentiates um, Iran from, from other countries in the region, if only looking through, through the EU lens. Um, so what what would happen, and, and again, I, I mean, I could uh, could talk more about what we have written, but since that is out there, uh, let me just give you a couple of, of thoughts, uh, you know, what would have to happen for Iran to move into that other part of the book. Um, and here, I think, um, besides, you know, whatever uh, can or should take place in Iran proper, uh, it is also on the European Union um, to come up with a more comprehensive uh, approach, uh, with a regional approach to see Iran um, as a country uh, belonging to a region, having close relations and, and closer still um, with uh, countries in the region, not just focusing on uh, the nuclear file, but seeing also the relations uh, with neighbors such as Iraq, obviously, but Afghanistan also to the other side. Um, Iran is, is very active um, in the region, something that usually you know, gets um, noted uh, through this, um, this uh, idea of malign activities, um, as it is often often called uh, by, by certain um, uh, certain policymakers, uh, but it is a role which is again seen, seen differently also uh, in this wider region, and this is the way the European Union would do well uh, to approach this, this panoply of issues that, that it has with, with Iran. Um, and just to give two examples um, where, where I do see um, you know, um, benefits uh, for the European Union to engage, um, there are issues uh, pertaining to nuclear safety, um, the issue that uh, Iran now does have a nuclear program, so we're not only looking at uh, the prevention of, um, of uh, nuclear proliferation, but we should also be looking at how this nuclear program is being run. There is a nuclear program, a civilian nuclear program, on the other side of the Gulf in the UAE, the, um, Saudi Arabia is trying to develop a nuclear program. Mm -hmm. So there is ample room for cooperation um, uh, when it comes to safety standards, disaster preparedness, early warning, etc. cetera. Um, and the similar issue is uh, maritime security. Um, as all these countries uh, sit, or most of these countries sit around uh, the Persian Gulf um, uh, with its uh, ecosystem, with its uh, heavy traffic uh, ships passing through. Um, and these are elements where the European Union uh, does have a role to play. Um, they are you know, outside of the traditional scope, I would say. They are certainly outside of what the European Union um, has focused on when it comes to Iran over the past 20 years, as I said. Uh, but it is something where it has a track record of uh, engaging other countries, other regions where it has a thematic track record, so to say, 
Um, and it is in, in that sense, it is good uh, that the European Union is indeed developing um, a regional strategy now. Uh, there is a, a commu commission communication coming up uh, this summer um, outlining a regional strategy towards uh, the Middle East. And there is also uh, a strategy coming uh, out of the European Parliament um, uh, when it comes to uh, that particular region. So the, the main EU institutions uh, taking this this broader look and trying to to get a grasp um, uh, not just of of Iran as as a country or as a um, a difficult um, uh, partner, a difficult interlocutor um, to be very neutral, um, but uh, as a country which is embedded in the region. Um, and this is uh, uh, maybe something where uh, the history, as we outline it, and and uh, someone mentioned this before, um, we actually stopped uh, when there was still. Um, uh, another president in the White House. Um, so the time has passed since then, um, but this may still provide, um, uh, you know, a track record of where, how the European Union came to this point in time uh, and how it could then develop further. Cornelius, let me just do a, a couple of follow-up questions. I mean, do you, see, uh, do you see a deal being signed today? And do you see room for the, now the push we're hearing about by the EU special representative to try and get a deal signed. And if a deal is not signed, what next? Yeah, um, well, that's that's the, the main question. I mean, the, I would say the chances are still somewhat 50-50 uh, without being privy to, to what is precisely going on right now. What is the, the you know, the, the magic formula the EU is trying to come up with? I mean, for, for all those who are, who are not following this so closely, it, it seems to be hanging on the question of the designation of the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, the IRGC, um, as uh, a terrorist organization by the United States. Um, Iran wants to have this undone. The United States, the administration, the president, uh, and certainly Congress are highly unwilling uh, to do that. There have been votes in Congress um, to forbid basically uh, the uh, administration um, to, to enter into such a compromise. Um, so this is really a deadlock. It's it's highly symbolic. Um, you don't want to get into the substance of it because it doesn't really matter so much. Um, it could be done easily if you wanted a deal, but then again, there is you know there are implications uh, for the Iranian side. Um, why they insist on on this being done? Uh, there is a reason for the U.S. Uh, government, the U.S. administration, for domestic reasons why it doesn't want to, do, to go that way. So this is, it has come down to this, to a non-nuclear issue basically. Um, and I, I cannot see, unless you know, some side really giving ground, I don't see where the compromise, uh, compromise should lie. Uh, that's why I'm calling it 50-50. Um, what happens if we don't have that deal? I mean, right now the, the attention is elsewhere. Right now, uh, despite um, the non-resolution of this um, this issue, uh, relations are fairly uh, stable. Um, there is no major confrontation being expected right now between United States and Iran or between Iran and regional powers. But it could happen every day, um, and that's the problem. Um, we don't know where we are in the fall. Um, it may last. It may give us another six months of uh, relative calm. Again, I'm, I'm being careful in, in choosing my words. Um, but then, if if we don't re resolve this now, we have a, a, a worse situation in the fall. Um, so I'm I'm not truly optimistic. I I still think well, but I'm I'm only as scholar, I can be, you know, sober minded, I don't have to pay attention to domestic politics, I think a deal can be struck. Um, and it ought to be struck, obviously. Um, and the one good thing is that I that I do see the Europeans trying again to get this over the finishing line. Uh, there was a, a lot of silence uh, for some time. Uh, again, people in Brussels were busy doing other things, but um, making another push is at least a, a good effort on the side of the Europeans. Thanks, Cornelius. Let me ask you a final question then. I mean, Iran does engage with um, certain activities uh, that the EU is opposed to, including missile development and deployment. So beyond the nuclear file, it's involved, as you know, it's expanded its influence in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen. Um, severe restrictions on individual liberties. So in a sense, what does the EU have any influence? Is it able, assuming a deal is struck tomorrow, uh, is it able to sway Iran on any of these activities uh, well, in any shape or form? 
Yeah, you, you you mentioned a number of issues, and and many of these are um, are relevant also from a, a European perspective. Um, I think the the leverage of the EU uh, comes, um, you know, in in, in differentiations um, on regional security. There is not so much. Um, this this cannot be the EU alone. It will have to deal with. Um, with regional uh, countries, um, Israel, Saudi Arabia, I mean, anything that has to do with, uh, with the missile program um, had better be dealt with in a regional setting where, one, where countries can talk about or governments can talk about threat perceptions, about conventional deterrence, about uh, capabilities, um, arms, uh, procurements around the Persian Gulf. Um, this is nothing where, where the EU alone can, uh, can have an impact. Um, on the uh, the question of um, of human rights of society, um, I I'd be more optimistic if and when we do have this deal and the EU can offer to broaden the relations to engage uh, again in trade and in, um, in technological cooperation in providing funds for say uh, the, the green energy transition um, something that that is very much on vogue in in Brussels and in European countries but which is also uh, needed in, in Iran. Um, as, as people know, it is a water bankrupt country in dire need of, of upgrading its, its infrastructure. And certainly the EU can help here. And if the EU made um, involvement of citizens of civil society conditional for its programs and for its support, um, this is something where it uh, little by little can, can change, um, but uh, not on, on all these things and not on all of them uh, immediately, certainly. No, and I think also uh, Iran's regional activities are another sore point, at least from a regional perspective. Uh, it's something that and this is one of the concerns with if, should the HACPOA be signed, will this uh, increase the release, will the release of funding that comes with the signature of a deal uh, trigger more uh, activism, regional activism by Iranian, uh, by Iran and its proxies across the region. But this is a topic for another discussion. Um, what I, we have about uh, 15 minutes left. What I'd like to do actually is maybe come back to all the panelists and ask each of them to come with a couple having listened to all this discussion. Um, it's clear that, uh, I mean, my main takeaway is yes, the EU is very occupied with Ukraine at the moment. However, ultimately, as our panelists are, are, are pointing out, um, they cannot afford, and uh, as, as an EU, we cannot afford to look away from the region for too long. Uh, from the southern Mediterranean uh, shores uh, for uh, a number of reasons, because what happens mainly, what happens here does not stay here in short. So I would like to come back to you maybe and ask each of you to reflect for a couple of minutes each on uh, how you could see perhaps a more positive involvement or more engage or engagement uh, by EU uh, by the EU with the different challenges that you've already outlined. So let me begin with Frederica. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, uh, it's uh, uh, it is a bit of a difficult task because uh, uh, I mean. Uh, I already said a little bit uh, uh, where I am optimist, uh, meaning that there are you know, many things going on and potentially, you know, the EU could make uh, a difference. I think that in the case of uh, Iran, for instance, it would be really pressing that they, uh, you know, that they bring this, uh, as Cornelius said, uh, over the finishing line uh, because it is so close. Uh, and it would settle so many uh, other dossiers uh, that it would definitely contribute uh, to create something, a, a stability uh, uh, in the region. Um, uh, in, in other cases, uh, I can see how uh, it, it is also quite complicated to get over the legacy of a sort of uh, conceptual paradigm that the EU has um, worked on, you know, uh, focusing on economic instruments to deliver political gains. Um, and it has worked on this paradigm for so long. And at the moment, it is becoming overwhelmingly clear that it is not working. And in fact, it should work the other way around. Uh, and therefore, the, the go-to instrument of the EU has generally been to throw money 
uh, to the uh, to buy a solution, so to say. Uh, but uh, this instead is becoming um, no longer uh, an option. The uh, road the EU is going on to, however, is marked uh, by security, defense, military stuff that unfortunately. Uh, uh, again, misses the mark of politics, and I think that there, I think uh, uh, it would bring, uh, you know, the difficult uh, uh, outcome uh, uh, in a different way. Um, I'll just also pick up, uh, use my two minutes uh, for ten seconds on two questions that were raised uh, in the uh, Q and A. Uh, one by Dr. Colin Lecce, apologies for uh, mispronouncing it in case about this and Remo conference, uh, which is generally a quite a sophisticated way to ask about settlements. Um, and, uh, you know, on what basis uh, would the EU engage with the uh, settlements? Uh, and this is a pillar for the EU not to engage with the uh, settlements uh, uh, for what, it, uh, and that's what the differentiation policy uh, has done uh, in a way to protect the other part of the Balfour Declaration, which was uh, uh, enshrined in the San Remo uh, conference, namely uh, the rights of uh, all uh, populations uh, in Palestine, and therefore to, uh, in, put, to put it in contemporary terms uh, to protect the two-state solution. Uh, Paul Arts asked about uh, the Israeli lobby. Uh, in a way, yes, this is a, a Benedetta's topic more than mine, but uh, my take on this one is that the Israeli lobby does its job, you know, it's there. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of lobbies uh, doing their own job. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, how much space are they given? Uh, how much uh, uh, room are they granted? Um, and this is where, you know, a more um, self-confident uh, EU foreign policy could help. But I'll stop there. Thank you, Frederica. Benedetta? Um, Yes, uh, I, 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 I share um, uh, the view of Federica, especially on the uh, role of the Israeli lobby, for example. And um, yes, it plays a role, but we should not even overstate it. And, um, and it also probably depends how the EU reacts to all, uh, to all these. Um, in a sense, um, I am a bit more pessimistic. <laughs> Uh, probably of what the EU can do in the near future, because in a way I see too many uh, hotspots and uh, a difficulty probably to tackle all of them uh, at the same uh, at the same time. So, um, despite their links and despite the fact that probably being able to um, link some of the issues would uh, would would help, but um, given the fact that being united behind a foreign policy dossier is proving hard. And we see even on the Ukrainian case now with the energy issue and Hungary and et cetera. So I, I mean, I, I think the EU will probably still be a bit more reactive than proactive as probably most of the panelists are wishing for. Uh, but I, I think I stop here because I don't want to steal too much time also for the other panelists. Thank you, Bernadetta. Unfortunately, I tend to agree with you. Maria. Uh, yes, so, uh, well, I just wanted to conclude on a, on a, on a quick point. Uh, I, my concern is uh, that uh, I see a lot of, uh, um, uh, um, a lot of hope and momentum uh, from uh, many analysts uh, uh, looking at the EU foreign policy now, saying, "Okay, the EU has found once again, has finally found its unity." You know, and then that was the main theme uh, when the Ukraine war happened. And I am, I tend to really um, be uh, skeptical, um, in line with also what uh, Federica was saying, finding momentum in into a defense and security uh, response, it doesn't mean solving the main underlying political issues. And in my opinion, the, this region, the MENA region is going to soon, as you Maha outlined, going to actually uncover 
all these uh, fault, all these gaps that still are in the European system, uh, all these divisive issues, specifically in the Eastern Mediterranean, that are going to emerge very soon. Another refugee crisis. I mean, you name it. And I think that uh, um, that this is why I'm very cautious sitting uh, here in Amman, uh, looking at this euphoria behind the new revived European identity. I think that very soon, either if a deal of the JCPOA is not going to work and there is going to be new escalation happening. Either the regional cooperation that we're seeing is not going to work as well as we hope. Either that the new global challenge, the climate crisis, other like wheat crisis are going to basically just unleash new, new issues. The unresolved relation between Turkey and the EU itself and now it's controversial. I mean, you name it. So there are so many black spots that are unresolved in the European system, and uh, I am very skeptical of this uh, European, uh, Euro this euphoria around the newfound European unity, which is, in my opinion, going to be uh, very soon challenged by events on the ground coming from this part of the world. Thank, thank you, Maria. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not that optimistic about what the EU can do, and also the momentum regarding if common foreign security policy, like the, to what extent the EU, which is known for losing a lot of opportunities, would really benefit from that, domestically talking. Externally, I'm not also optimistic about the EU involvement in the region, especially after the lack, the, the decline in the legitimacy of the EU and the European Union and the Western leaders, how they treated, because there's a huge comparison and discussion and working on something related to legitimacy how the EU treated the Ukrainian crisis and considered the uh, Russian aggression and invasion and turned a blind eye to whatever is happening uh, by the West in different countries from Mali to Iraq to Afghanistan to uh, you name it. Uh, so the legitimacy of the EU is under question there. And I think uh, this is problematic. The second thing, a, a deal with Iran without taking into consideration the regional uh, proxy terrorist groups who are basically threatening the entire uh, regional stability is not a good deal. Uh, and I think uh, this is something that has to be taken into consideration. But let us face it, the EU doesn't really care much about uh, the, uh, they want just the deal because, the, because with the Ukrainian crisis, we, we have a lot of economic interest to sign a deal with Iran. Will the EU be able to do something about the human rights and democracy and stuff in Iran? I don't think so, because it's not a priority. It has never been a priority for the EU in any of the MENA regions, despite that we try to wear a normative hat, but we are really acting realist, in a realist way. Last but not least, I think in terms of Lebanon, uh, I think the EU still and was and continued to be one of the main uh, partners to Lebanon. And we see this collab the collaboration between the EU and the Gulf countries uh, has led, especially the role of France with the Gulf countries has resulted in a positive thing by bringing back the, uh, the diplomatic relations back to, uh, or at least the ambassadors back to Lebanon and the collaboration between the French and the Gulf to help the Lebanese people uh, is important. So also uh, one thing that we cannot ignore is the EU is not the only player in the region. The region is full of many other players, regional and international, and this is increasing significantly. We see the Russians, the Chinese are more involved in the Gulf countries and also okay. in the region. Turkey is also a main player, the US awesome. and the EU. Sorry, I need to there. move to Cornelius. Thank yeah. you. Cornelius, uh, final word is to you. Uh, thank you, Maha. And, and just building on what Asem uh, finished on, um, I think if I want to be optimistic, it would be uh, how the EU's uh, approach has actually evolved over those uh, past decades. Um, uh, it does take a bit of humbleness, uh, the awareness or the, the um, yeah, the awareness that um, it is not a big player in the region anymore. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't so big uh, uh, as, as the union. Uh, sometimes member states have, have more important relations, um, but that it has evolved. Um, it's no longer, and I did see some comments in the text about, you know, how the European Union is only after uh, trade relations and, and, you know, puts business first. 
Um, that is a, a view which, according to my uh, understanding, is stuck in the 1990s. Um, that is when the EU started a critical dialogue, but actually only wanted uh, to, to engage uh, with Iran um, uh, on, in, in economic terms. Um, if that were true, um, uh, we wouldn't have seen uh, the, the sanctions regime of the early 2000s. Uh, we wouldn't have seen, uh, or we would have seen uh, much more pushback um, when it comes to how the Europeans um, tried uh, to, to counter uh, President Trump's uh, maximum pressure com campaign. Uh, ultimately, they, they installed a, a officially a, a trading regime, but they never used it um, because ultimately uh, this was not important enough for them. Um, and I guess because everyone mentioned Ukraine, let me do that too. I mean, they, they, this view that is presented as the, with the EU as an economic uh, only actor um, was also probably the view prevalent in the Kremlin uh, until the end of February. Um, and when uh, also President Putin found out that yes, the Europeans uh, can take a cut um, uh, when it comes to, to sanctions, uh, they are willing to put uh, fundamental principles first. Um, so uh, building on this, I, I am somewhat optimistic that the EU can develop this comprehensive approach going forward, uh, taking in the views of countries in the region, being more collaborative, taking in uh, the views uh, from, from outside experts, from civil society. Um, that is something that, uh, you know, puts me in a mildly positive uh, mood. Thank you, Cornelius, for ending us on a positive note, uh, or trying to at least. <laughs> I think it's a toy note that's probably up for even more discussion. But uh, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank the hosts uh, for, I think, what I think was an engaging discussion. Uh, and uh, Dimitris has already put in the chat the details for the next uh, meeting, which will be looking at development economics, trade, and societal issues uh, between the EU and MENA countries. So thank you all for joining, uh, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Ma, also. Thank you. Bye-bye.